Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm Katie. I am the Mass Lift AmeriCorps Community Engagement Coordinator here at Helltown Land Trust. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. The bathroom is right to the right of the door that you came in. There's also hot beverages and cold beverages there and food in the back. If you missed it, please help yourself to it. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Helltown Land Trust. We're a nonprofit um, land trust organization founded in 1986 as an all-volunteer land trust. Um, we now serve 13 towns, uh, rural towns west of the Connecticut River. We have a little bit of overlap with Franklin Land Trust in Conway. Um, but that's, we serve separate areas other than that. Um, so by 2009, Hilltown Land Trust was exploring options beyond being all volunteer and affiliated with the trustees of the reservations. Um, this is a trustee's property and we rent the office space from them. Um, this partnership allows us to focus on the core of our mission, which is protecting and stewarding land in these uh, towns, and gives administrative support from a larger organization. Um, to this day, Hilltown Land Trust has protected over 4,000 acres of land across that area on some 40 properties. Um, a big part of what we do is also public education and engagement events like this one. Um, and we're able to protect land and organize events like this thanks to our membership. Um, if you are a member, thank you. If not, please consider becoming one. It's $35 for a year for a whole family. Um, and you get reduced price or free admissions to events like this. This event was free already, so it wouldn't have helped you there. But <laughs> um, and I should also mention the AmeriCorps program that I'm part of, um, Mass Lift AmeriCorps now known as TerraCore, um, helps Helltown Land Trust. We only have one three-quarter time staff member and one and a half AmeriCorps members. I'm the half. Um, there's a full-time person here too. Um, and it helps HLT put on events like this and um, organize volunteers to do our stewardship. So, um, and I should mention, we've got a couple events coming up. One is this Saturday, uh, the Birds and Butterflies of the Bullet Grasslands, which is the opening of this exhibit that you see here by John Bodie, who's back here. He's a trustee staff member and naturalist. Um, that's at 11 o'clock on Saturday, the first. Um, there'll be the opening reception with pie from Florence Pie Bar, um, <laughs> and a nature walk up to the upper meadow here. Um, and then, I think I handed these out to everybody, um, Butterflies and Books at Bullet, Sunday, July 16th, which is here as well, at 10.30 a.m. Um, we're going to have Mike Kelly, who's the Rare Books and Special Collections Librarian at Amherst College, bring some Lepidoptera and entomological books from their collection here to show people. And then John Bodie is going to leave folks outside to find some of the butterflies that we saw in the books. So, um, Please come to those. Uh, the butterfly, the birds and butterflies of Bullet is free and open to anybody. The butterflies and books at Bullet does require pre-registration. So um, my email address and phone number are on these flyers, and you can get in touch with me if you want to register. Um, so we're delighted to be partnering with Franklin Land Trust and Dr. Gear on this project. Um, Emily contacted me um, about doing this because. They wanted the space, and we were happy to help out because this is a great um, event. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Emily and Ron. Great. Emily. Thank you, Katie. Um, it's been really wonderful partnering with the Hilltown Land Trust and Katie for this event. So thank you so much, Katie. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Emily Johnson, or MJ. I am a land steward with the Franklin Land Trust. Uh, similar to the Hilltown Land Trust and the trustees, we are a land conservation organization operating uh, in a slightly different area in Franklin County and some surrounding towns, uh, working with private landowners and uh, public organizations to protect property from development. Um, we have protected over 30,000 acres to date, um, and includes only, not only over 140 privately owned properties and, and uh, probably a dozen or so that we own, and many of those are open to the public with trails and fishing, hiking, uh, community gardening opportunities. For folks to enjoy. Um, Rob Jagir contacted us about a month ago with uh, loads of enthusiasm about his Bombus species and the research he's been doing. Um, and he's working with us and one of his interns on 
identifying species that are on lands that the Franklin Land Trust owns, um, but we also need more information on species that are uh, present in our area. And so Rob's research is about that, and he will talk more about that, and we're really hopeful that you guys are all able to help with that research, so we'll talk more about how to do that. So without further ado, thank you so much, Rob. Thank you. And, uh, how are you? <laughs> uh, so thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so the way that I plan things, I'm going to talk a little bit about pollinator decline and conservation, and then uh, uh, we're going to go outside and, and put some of the our BID skills to work. Um, so there are three things I'd like to accomplish through today's talk. The first is to clear up um, quite a few public misconceptions about pollinator decline conservation. I think if I mention save the bees or pollinator friendly, a lot of you immediately will think of, I could put money on what, what comes to mind. Um, and so we're going to talk about the two, there are actually two sides to the pollinator decline and conservation issue that are clearly distinct and need different approaches. Uh, one gets a lot of press and the other one isn't getting as much and that's the focus of our research is to sort of, and my public outreach mission is to sort of increase awareness of this other side. The second is to give you um, basic skills on bumblebee identification, so you can look at your property and you can look at how many different how many species you have. Um, and the third is to try to recruit recruit you at some level to our ecology project, and I'll talk a bit about that. And there are different ways you can participate. So, you know, we, if you have an Android phone or you have an iPhone, you can participate through data collection. If if you um, want to just give uh, either myself or one of my grad students access to your land so we can do surveys, that would be great. Uh, if you want to want to run workshops because you think that other people in your area might be interested in participating in the project, you know, there are a variety of, of levels. Um, the one thing, you know, what I was I'm very excited to start, so this is the first year we've been surveying um, in Franklin and Hampshire counties, um, and historically, you'll be happy to know, historically, this was the Bumblebee Diversity Center of Massachusetts. Oh. So this was the hotspot, and what we're hoping is that it's still the diversity hotspot. And many of the species that we don't see in the east, and many of one of the species on the endangered species list, Bombasalis, <coughs> that was listed earlier this year, the first bumblebee on the endangered species list, and one that's close to follow, Bombs tricola. Um, if they are in Massachusetts, my I have a strong hunch that they're going to be in this area. And that's why I really, and you know, I'm living north part of Framingham, work in Worcester, so commuting out here to do surveys every day is a bit much, so I'm trying to extend. And ideally, through our project, we'd like to get groups from every county in the state, and through the app, we can compile or crowdsource data, and we can use those data to try to um, answer questions like, what should I plant in my garden to increase native bee diversity? Or how should I manage my land? Right now, we have no clue. People will tell you that they have a clue, and we'll get into that in a minute, but really we don't know what to plant to maintain or save that species on the endangered species list. Um, and so we're trying to fill in some of those gaps. So those are the three three goals. Uh, so the problem, I'm just use my space bar. So the problem, I'm sure you're all aware, is that Pollinators are in a state of unprecedented decline worldwide. So species, um, bumblebees, for example, are declining in abundance, species richness, and geographic range uh, in North America uh, and Europe. There have been documented declines. Um, and as well, uh, there are documented uh, monarch butterflies or pollinators, uh, you know, not as important as the bees, but the, the, we'll talk about this in a minute, but they all have equal importance from an ecological perspective. Um, but I'm sure most of you are familiar with the, the honeybee and colony collapse disorder. So most, you know, I've given a lot of these talks, and when I say pollinator decline or pollinator friendly, immediately people talk about colony collapse disorder. And right away, I want to differentiate what's going on with the wild native bees, like bumblebees. So that's Bombus aphanus, the one on the endangered species list. This is Bombus tricola, which is uh, closely related to aphanus and is also um, it's thought to be um, extirpated from the state, but um, there was one spotted a couple of years ago in Petersham. So again, I'm hoping we're going to find this one, and there's some evidence that this one's still around out in the garden. We'll talk about that later. 
I haven't seen one, but I've seen the signature of this bee. Um, but anyway, so we have our wild bees, and then we have a honeybee colony collapse disorder. Uh, just to give you a bit of history about pollinator decline. So I knew that these species, bumblebee species, and other native bees were in decline in the late 90s, early 2000s, right? And I tried to do the same talks and get the word out of talking about the importance of pollinators. But it wasn't until colony collapse disorder happened in 2006 that the public became aware or interested in pollinator decline because of the importance of honeybees in agriculture. Mm -hmm. All right. At that point, now everybody is very you know excited about pollinators and, and conserving pollinators. But the problem is that this honeybee bias has crept in, and, and we're sort of not doing the right thing to help out these native bees. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, colony collapse is, is obviously a negative. If you're a beekeeper or a farmer, you don't get adequate pollination. But from a wild bee perspective, it was a savior because now people are actually paying attention to all bees. They would be all extinct and nobody would even know or care. Mm -hmm. And so the, the honeybee has really helped to increase awareness. Past that point, we really need to think about them as two completely separate beasts. All right. So I want to I want to make that that clear, and I'll show you. I'll you know I'll go over why this is, and sort of the different, pers the two faces of pollinator decline, and then how we have to think about pollinator conservation in two, two different ways. We have to wear two hats. We can't, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. So obviously, pollinators have social and economic importance in this area. There's a lot of agriculture, so this should be, you know, hit home um, for a lot of you. Um, so this is just giving you an idea of some of the food that we um, eat that, that uh, we rely on pollinators for. Um, in addition, you know, they, um, bees pollinate things like cotton, so it's not just food. There's a whole industry. And so, pollinator decline, if we start to lose honeybees or things that pollinate our crops, obviously that has important social consequences. We don't, we have less food to eat, less food available, and also there are economic consequences, right? It's going to cost more to eat those things that are still around. And also, you have to think that pollination is a multi-billion dollar a year industry in North America alone. We're talking trillions of dollars worldwide, and so there is strong economic incentive to focus on certain pollinators that are important in this context. All right, the honeybees being being one of them. And so here's here is so pollinator conservation. If we look at things from the agricultural perspective, which clearly is important, here's what we're faced with. Here's canola, um, blueberry. We've got orchards. So we've got these large areas that are all monoculture. And we need to make sure that we have enough bees to pollinate all of these flowers. And we're talking, you know, acres and acres and acres of, of area that needs to be pollinated. So we need a lot of bees to do that. So here, this is each, this is a, a, a flatbed truck. Each of these squares is a hive of honeybees. And each of these squares has about 10 to 50,000 bees in it. So you can imagine, and there have been news stories, one of these turns over, it's a nightmare, right? We're talking millions and millions of bees. But basically what happens is that, they, that, that these bees are trucked around, they, let's say they're in California, they're trucked around the country, and they're, um, they park, they let the bees go, they do their thing, and then they move on to the next area. Okay. So um, what, the point that I want to make with this, so the honeybee is, is obviously a, ma a major pollinator in this context, and very important. One of, one of our native bumblebee species, Bombus impatiens, is used commercially to, to pollinate things like tomato and, and peppers and, and um, things that need to be buzz pollinated because um, honeybees don't buzz pollinate, so they're really good for that. So a lot of uh, greenhouse operations um, have um, used bumblebees, um, managed bumblebees to, to do the pollination because there's enough airflow to pollinate um, the, the tomatoes or peppers or whatever. And they're also a couple of other native species that are used for, for crop pollination. So from the pollinator conservation end is we need enough bees. So the issue really is, is one of abundance. And so what is going on is that the honeybees are in decline and people start to worry that we're going to run out of honeybees and we're not going to be able to get our crop yield to where we need it to be. Our pollination levels are going to be too low. So the idea is, okay, well let's, let's look to our native pollinators to do this. The problem is that well, it would be a good thing if you're looking at it from an ecological perspective. From an from agricultural perspective, all you care about is abundance. So you don't need, the diversity doesn't matter, you just need a lot of something. So one species could fill the gap left by the honeybee. And so all the conservation strategies are to try to increase 
a, a particular type or abundance of just one species that could fill in the gaps for the left for the honeybee. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that once you can imagine that from a native pollinator's perspective, so these are pollinators in the wild, they have a feast for two weeks. The populations go up. When this goes away, they start looking for food. And if there's no food, the population just crashes, right? So um, it, it's, it, what, they're, what they've evolved to do, and if you look at things from an ecological perspective, we'll switch it for a minute, the, the, the story is, is very, very, very different. So in addition to the social and economic importance, pollinators play a very important ecological role. So all of our native pollinators are, are what are called keystone species. That means that their value is more than just a single species, that their, their presence in the ecosystem has a cascading positive effect on other species. So this is the typical environment that we that a bee would encounter in the wild, right? We've got many native plants. Let's go back in time. They have many, this is an alpine meadow in Colorado that I worked in for a couple of summers, so you can imagine I didn't want to leave there. But um, <laughs> anyway, running through the meadow chasing bees, you know, it's all uh, it's a dream. And then, then, you have to, then you have to get a job. You can't be a <laughs> um, Anyway, so we've got our, our bees, but you, we've got all of the we've got a lot of native plant diversity that requires pollinators to um, for reproduction, right? So we have all these plants that are supporting a, a bunch of native pollinators, and the seeds and fruit produced from our, our um, plants in the wild supply food for our chipmunks and our birds, right? The plant material is nesting sites for our bird species in decline, and also protection from predators. And so this level then is supplying food to this level, as much as we don't want to think about you know, predation, it's there. And so if we start removing bees here, we get fewer seeds, and it's going to, we're going to get this cascading effect. Um, and so, it's re so pollinator decline from an ecological perspective is important in terms of global biodiversity. The problem is we have no clue where we are in the process of ecosystem collapse. Right? So eventually we're going to start removing species through extinction. Those interactions are going to be lost and those effects are going to be lost forever. And it's going to have permanent effects on our ecosystem and eventually our ecosystem is going to be so stressed it's going to collapse altogether and we're going to have major declines in biodiversity. Now, there's no immediate economic value to that. However, we do rely on our ecosystems for a lot of different services. Water purification, decomposition. There are a lot of these free services nature provides us, pollination being one of them, that we rely on. And eventually, when we, get, we start to see that these uh, reductions in biodiversity because we lose our pollinators, we're going to start to pay a lot more for these services because we're going to have to generate them ourselves. We lose pollinators, like in China, we're going to have to go and hand pollinate our crops. Right? That's important. If we lose our pollinators in this context, we're losing a lot more than crops. Now, I'm not saying, and I always you know, pause at this part, I'm not saying that the agricultural context isn't important. It is important. I'm saying this is equally important. That's all I'm saying. And when we think about pollinator decline and wild and, and diversity and pollinators are important because they support our, our, our wildflowers, people really don't think about it this deeply. They're thinking about honeybees and food on our table. And unfortunately, because there's a lot of money involved, the conservation strategies are leaning heavily to the direction in the direction of the agricultural context and the honeybee. And we're tailoring resources and floral environments to the honeybee. And as we'll see, we've got many, many species that we need to, to worry about. So when I say diverse, so the next thing then is um, when we start to think about things ecologically, we have to think about the interaction between our native bees or native pollinators and our native flowering plants. The one thing that's getting lost in all the pollinator decline discussion is native plants. Our native plants have been declining in Massachusetts um, for years and it's going right along with our pollinator declines. But nobody's thinking about the native plants. And the native plants are, the, you know, if, if they rely on, on animals for pollination, and 80 to 90 percent of flowering plants do, that um, the fact that we're losing pollinator species, we have no idea what effect it's having on native plants because we don't know enough about the interaction between native plants and native pollinators to be able to say this, we should start 
protecting this plant species because it's keeping this bee species or by, by losing this bee species, we're losing this native plant species. We, we can't form those links. And our ecology project, looking forward, is trying to fill in those gaps. All right? and, and just over two years, we've collected, you know, just through myself and my grad student, we've collected enough data where I can say, we need this plant species to keep this bee species. We don't have enough for the rare species yet, but for some of the common ones, I know that if I see this plant species, I'm going to see this bumblebee species. And that's just after a couple of years. And I also know if, if, I put, if I see an exotic, I know that diversity is going down and a certain bumblebee species is going up. And it's one that, that um, isn't really being impacted by um, whatever is causing the other ones to decline. Anyway, so before I get into how we, de how we develop effective ecological conservation strategies, we need to understand a couple of things. Um, so it's like pollination biology 101. So from the bees' perspective, obviously, you know, they're visiting flowers for nectar, which is their source of carbohydrate, and pollen, which is their source of protein. They need both to survive. Pollen makes, um, you know, in the case of, of bumblebees, is what's needed to make new bees. So if, you, if they don't have good pollen sources, they're not going to make workers or reproductives. If they have good sources of pollen, they'll survive forever, but they're not going to produce new bees. So they're, if we take away nectar, they're only going to live for 24 hours to 48 hours, depending on what they have in their reserve. So the nectar keeps them going, but pollen is needed to continue the, the population. And both of them together, obviously, are needed, but they're, they're two separate things. They, they have different uh, functions um, from, from the perspective of bee physiology. So the bee, when it goes into the environment, it's faced with, with a lot of decisions. And so, you know, every decision that this bee makes has an important consequence for flowering plants, right? Because the flowering plants can't find a mate. They are totally dependent on the animal to decide who they're going to mate with. So if this bee goes purple to purple, it's a good thing from the plant's perspective because the pollen, which is the male gametes, go to the female reproductive structures of a, another plant. If the bee decides to go from purple to yellow to red to this pinkish one, the bee might be getting lots of food, but from the plant's perspective, this is a bad thing, right? Because it's, it's wasting its male gametes on this yellow one, and this yellow one's receiving the wrong gametes, and it's blocking the reproductive female reproductive tract and preventing it from getting yellow pollen. So there's a cost to how bees behave. So one thing that people don't realize is they think, oh, if I see a lot of bees around, it's a good thing. Well, no, it depends on how those bees are behaving. If I wipe bees out, clearly that has a direct impact on plant fitness. If I alter bee behavior from an ecological perspective, it's going to have a major consequence for our native flowering plants. And that's going to pollen transfer that affects reproductive success, which affects population change. And guess what? Pesticides and disease affect bees' behavior. So it doesn't kill them, but it changes their behavior, so they do more of this than what the plant wants them to do. And the reason that we have so, so much floral diversity is because it's the plant's way of manipulating pollinators to do what they want. Because from the bee's perspective, specializing on purple is the best thing it can do to get the most food per unit of time. It's making good decisions. If we impair its brain, it starts to make bad decisions, and that has effects on how much nectar it takes in, but also has a consequence for the plant. So the two start to spiral down together, okay? Now, for those of you that don't believe that and this is, I, this is our eye candy break. Uh, monarch butterflies, just that, you know, I worked on monarch butterflies when I was at UMass Medical School. So, um, just to show you that most, all of the food intake, a lot of people think that because they're insects, nonsense, okay? There are a few species that have these innate preferences, but most of the time it's done through learning. So, just to show you with monarch yeah. butterflies, um, so if you touch their four legs with sugar water, they stick out their tongue. It's like Pavlov's dog, it's an it's a innate response, re reflex. And so what we do is we, we show them a color or give them an odor or a shape, and then we wait a couple of seconds, and then we touch the, their four legs, and as soon as their tongue touches the sugar water, they form an association in their brain between that color and, um, and that odor. So we could then go through the test phase. So we show them blue. You can see that their tongue isn't moving. Their antennae are moving. We show a similar color. So we train them to yellow. We still see no response, and then we show them yellow, wait for it, all of a sudden we see a strong response, they're starting to look for food. All right? This butterfly, after two pairings, learns that color and will remember it for two months. 
for its lifetime. Mm. And I can train it to a collar and order. So even though their brain's the size of a pinhead, they've got pretty good abilities. And by the way, so what they're doing is nothing compared to what a bumblebee can do in terms of learning and memory and cognition. Like they're at the level of vertebrates and what bees do. And think about their environment. They've got food that's constantly changing over time and space, and they have to track the food to outcompete other bees. So selection has really shaped their brains to be really good decision makers, and they are. And we studied this in the lab to some degree as well. Anyway. So back to pollinators, and what do we mean by pollinator diversity? So this is a postage stamp put out by the U.S. Postal Service a few years ago, and we see our four, you know, we've got our bats and our hummingbirds, and then we've got our bumblebee and our, our butterfly. And so there are about 200,000 pollinator species worldwide, only 1,000 are vertebrates, right? So the vast majority of what's important, we can't even see. They're, they're um, you know, bees, so in bees in North America alone, we have 4,000 different species species native to North America, 4,000, all right? And I'll, I'll go over numbers in a second. But these are cute and cuddly, and they make good post stamp, right? They're good um, on posters. Um, and they certainly are important, and there are plants that are adapted to bats and adapted to hummingbirds. But when we think about the diversity that we see with our native plants, most of it is insects, and most of that is done through the bees. Um, but each one has a, has a role to play. So just looking, this is North American numbers, native insect pollinator diversity, carpenter bees, those are the ones chewing holes in your deck. There are 33 different species of carpenter bee in North America. Bumblebees, which we're focusing on today, 50 different species, 25 east, 25 west. Mining bees, these are the really small ones you can barely see, 12, 1,200 species. Um, these sweat bees, they're really, they're, you can barely see them, but you can, they're the most beautiful things you've ever, like they're iridescent green and blue, and they come in these really cool colors. Um, 520 species, so, you know, there are the bees, we've got 700 species of butterfly, 11,000 species of moth, flies are important pollinators for a lot of our native plants, wasps do pollinate to some degree, I'll get into that in a second, <laughs> the difference between a wasp and a bee. Um, and beetles actually do uh, uh, quite a bit of pollinating as well. There are 25,000 different, uh, 25, different species that, visit, um, that would visit flowers for poll to eat pollen or, or to drink nectar. Okay? Now, the honeybee is not native to North America. Okay? And there's only one species. So one thing, when people say bees, and even if they think bumblebee, they're thinking one species. They're not thinking 50, and they're certainly not thinking 4,000. And they also group the honeybee in with the native bees. So honeybees are not native to North America, which means from an ecological perspective, now, again, the honeybee plays an important role in agriculture. Outside of that context, it plays zero role. So if we wipe the honeybee from North America, it would have zero ecological effect, if not a slightly positive effect, because they're competing for resources. Okay? There are no honeybee pollinated plants native to North America. But there are many, many bumblebee pollinated plants and bird pollinated plants, okay? So when we talk about diversity and pollinator friendly, we're talking, and we have a pollinator friendly garden, we're talking diversity and thousands and hundreds of species, not a lot of one thing. And I can't count how many times people have emailed me, I've got this great garden, there are bees everywhere. You gotta come and check it out. I go and check it out and it's one species. Historically, there have been 11 species in Massachusetts. Oh, this is just a bumblebee, this isn't of other native bees. Okay. So this idea of abundance equals diversity is, is um, really what people need to be more aware of, the, of the, what diversity actually means. And so when we put together our pollinator diversity and our, our native plant diversity and thinking about ecosystems, um, for ecological conservation strategy, the key thing is that one size does not fit all. There is not a magic plant that we can put in our gardens that's going to service 4,000 bee species. It does not work like that. If it did, we wouldn't have 4,000 species. We'd have one species because it would outcompete one another for that one resource. So each of our pollinators, native pollinators, has a special adaptation that allows them to coexist with the other ones at the same time. It may be they prefer certain it may be tongue length is the most straightforward one, right? So a bumblebee tongue is like, it's got a hard um, sheath, it opens up and there's a soft part that comes out. It jams that hard part into the flower and opens it up and then laps up the nectar. We've got our butterflies where the butterflies can move their tongues around. Bumblebees can't do that. Uh, flies can come with the short tongue housefly, like a, a mop uh, or a sponge. And then we also have long tongue flies as well. So what we want to do, if we want to develop effective conservation strategies, we have to appreciate that all the floral diversity we see matches pollinator diversity. And 
the, 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 and so it's, and this is just giving you an idea of all the different shapes that we could encounter um, when we're, when we're um, out in, a, in an alpine meadow or, or a, another um, natural meadow, grassland or wetland habitat. Um, and we need to think about that. And the long tongue bees are getting the short end of the stick. Why? Because the honeybee has a short tongue. All right? um, that's really what it comes down to. But I'll get, I'll get to that in a second. So, um, so just to give you like, the idea of magic and why it's important, we're just looking at two bumblebee species. This one has a medium tongue, and it's on goldenrod. You can see in this case, the bee just walks on the top of the goldenrod and it just is sticking its tongue in. It's very easy to access the nectar, and that's why in the fall you'll see tons of things on goldenrod. Because it's, it's, the flower is so shallow, anything can get at it, right? If we look at this toad flax, Linaria uh, vulgaris plant, butter and eggs, it's, it's a non-native, but the, the nectar is located at the base of this long spur, all right? So we, oops. So here's Bombus fervidus, which is our species that's in, in serious decline in the state. And you can see that it has to pry open the petals and then sticks its head in, and it sticks its tongue down to the base of this long spur to get the nectar. All right? This bee cannot outcompete that bee on a goldenrod. It will lose every time. So if we don't have uh, nectar sources, it's, 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 it's going to be outcompeted. Similarly, that species with medium and short tongues, those species can't compete with, with Bombus purpose on this one because they can't reach the nectar. All right, now, the Aphanus and stuff, they, uh, Aphanus and Tericola, there are species of bumblebee that bite holes down here and they cheat. <laughs> there are two species that do it, and one's on the endangered species list and the other one's on its way out. And I noticed the comfrey out here has perfect circular holes, mm -hmm. suggesting that those bees are in the area, one of the two. If it's Aphanus, it would be a major find, and if it's Tricola, it would still be a major find. So um, the, the, the way you tell, and, and they love to, anything with a tube, they bite a perfect circular hole at the base of the tube. So if you see bees, instead of going in the flower through the tube properly, which helps the plant, they're cheating and going in through a hole, that suggests that you have one of those two rare species in your area, and you should keep observing that plant species, and eventually it'll show up. Um, Okay, so medium and short tongue, we have many bumblebee species, and surpri not surprisingly, those ones are doing very well. The honeybee has a medium tongue to short tongue relative to a many of our bumblebee species. Its, its tongue length is about a fifth the length of this species. All right? So, we go online and we say, I want to make a pollinator garden. Let's, let's get some seed mixes. This is the bee's knees. This is called bee buddies. And, you know, and I'm, I'm looking for you know increased pollinator diversity. Look at all these flowers; they're all composites. You see anything with a long tube? Not many. I think there's one in here that would be considered good for a long tongue bee. And the other thing you have to remember is these bees are persisting through the summer. These things are blooming for like two weeks, and so even if it was available for two weeks, it's just not going to cut it, right? So, what do we put in our garden? Well, we we have to think about the structure of the flower. As, and that will help us to get there. And specifically, what do we put in? That's what our research is trying to figure out. What are what does Bombus fervidus love? Um, I know red clover is definitely something it likes, even though it's a non-native. But um, so we're trying to figure out what was the native that Bombus fervidus was was using prior to, or along with the, with the red clover. Anyway. Um, from an ecological perspective, separating out economic or the agricultural and the ecological. Honeybees and the one species of bumblebees, their life cycle is completely managed. We help them to reproduce. We feed them. We protect them through the winter. We um, help. We um, what else do we do? We we help to keep them free of disease. Right. Now let's look at the typical cycle for wild pollinators. This is the bumblebee cycle. Queens are the only thing that's, that that survives through the winter, and they hibernate. They thaw out in the spring, and they start looking for nest sites. If they find a nest site, they'll start collecting pollen. So if you see a queen in the spring, the queen bumblebees are anywhere from one to two inches. So they're quite large. You'll, see the, you'll hear them, and you'll see them flying close to the ground looking for nests, or you'll, you'll see them on your, on your flowers. They like um, or trees. Willow is a favorite spring um, pollen source for uh, bumblebees. Um, so once they find a nest, they lay eggs, and then the workers emerge. And then from that point forward, the queen never leaves the nest until she dies in the fall. All right. You'll only see work workers through the summer. 
Here we're still seeing some queens, so you're in the mixed phase. And we'll see that the species differ on when the queens start, when they, when they come out of hibernation, it, it differs for, for different species. Um, anyway, so they're collecting food, the amount of pollen and nectar they collect, they'll eventually switch to putting out reproductives, male bees and queens. They'll mate, the queen will find a place to overwinter, everybody else dies, the first or second hard frost, and the cycle continues. This is true of all of our native bees, right? They go through this cycle. If they're social, they set up a colony. If they're solitary, they still come out, they mate, or if they're already mated in the fall, the, the, the queens find a place to lay their eggs, and they continue to cycle. The reason that I bring this up is, if we're thinking about habitat, we need overwintering habitat. We don't have to worry about that here. We need nest sites. We don't have to worry about that here. We need resources. We don't have to worry as much about that over here, because we could give sugar water. Like the, at the bottom of one of these bumblebees, because they want them to, uh, to pollinate, so they give them as much sugar water as they need. At the bottom of each of these boxes of bumblebees, which holds about 100 to 500 bees, there's a big reservoir that has this red syrup. They won't tell me what's in it, but it has antibiotics, I'm sure, and different stuff in it. But they're well fed. Meanwhile, the same species in the wild is competing with all these other ones to try to get enough food. Um, and so we have to, we have to worry about, um, remember, the nectar and pollen are separate sources. Uh, okay, so we're using bumblebees as a model to try to understand and get data and get a strategy for, for protecting the 4,000 bees or you know, 10,000 pollinator species we have in North America. Most of the bees are very difficult to see and you'd have to get them under a microscope to be able to tell different species. Bumblebees, you can, for the most part, with 95% accuracy, tell them, tell which um, species you have on the wing. Meaning you can see them on flowers, you can take a video and you can figure out what you have. So, there are, bumblebees are the fuzzy black and yellow ones, all right? Um, they're, they're completely fuzzy down the, the, the rear end or the abdomen. All the other bees have shiny abdomen. So the first way, the first sign or the indication you have a bumblebee is that the abdomen has all fuzz and doesn't have any shine to it. Wasps are all shiny. There are a lot of flies that mimic bees, but you'll notice that the flies have short antennae. They only have two wings and their feet are around um, our feet are, are uh, different than the bumblebees. The bumblebees have hooks that they use to clasp on the flowers to hold them in position on windy days. Flies don't have that. Uh, but we'll get into the bumblebees, but th this is really what we're focused on with the, with the crop ecology project. Um, and here are the species that we had in Massachusetts. Historically, every one of these species was in this area. All right? And uh, interestingly, the ones in red are the ones in serious trouble. Bombus aphanus was one of the most, if not the most, abundant species in the area, and in Massachusetts. Bombus ferbatus was the other one that was the most, this one and Aphnus were the two most abundant. This one is on the endangered species list, and this one is headed there very quickly. This one is um, Tricola, the one I mentioned, and then Bombus vagans, and I saw Bombus vagans out here, which is a good sign. It's also in the same, it's not as bad as off as Bombus ferbatus, but it's close. So here's what we had to start with. Now, you know, in Eastern Mass, I'd be lucky to, to find um, seven species of bumblebee. Um, so this brings up another popular misconception about bee decline. All bees are not in trouble, okay? Some species are close to extinction. Others are doing better than they've ever, historically, their numbers are at, at, at uh, they're more abundant than they've ever been. So Bombus impatience, this one here, is a good example. Historically, it was probably fifth on the list in terms of abundance. Now it's by far number one. Mm -hmm. And this species, while these ones are declining, this one's increasing. So again, when people see a lot of bees, and they think a lot of bumblebees, and if you don't tell the species, you think this is great, but it's all bombus impatience. Mm -hmm. And I saw Tower Hill Botanic Garden in West Boston, so I go there, I give talks there as well. I went there one... Um, it was early in August a few years ago. I counted 2,000 bees. Every one was bombs and patients, not a single other species. <laughs> Earlier in the season, there was more diversity. So it just, it, and I'll show you some other numbers. And this one, whatever is killing off these other ones is actually helping this one. It could be the reduced competition. It could be that it just isn't affected. We're trying to figure out what that reason is. Um, certainly pesticides, it's less susceptible to pesticides than some of them in decline. And, and I don't, I'm not going to show those data today, but I'll mention it now. 
Um, so what is it? What do we think is causing bee decline? So again, colony collapse disorder in honeybees. There are you know disease and pesticides are the two main things. But when we look at wild bee decline, we actually, and, and nobody really is going to, to argue that it's habitat change that's the number one reason. It's just very difficult to figure out. And also, what's the point if agricultural, you know, economic value is important? It's just the money isn't there to put the focus here because the economic incentive isn't there. Okay? But this is likely what's causing decline. These things are not helping, but bees were in decline before the neonicotinoids hit the market. All right, wild bees. So it's likely accelerated declines in, in areas where these pesticides are used, but there's something else going on. Climate change, infectious agents. So originally when we saw these bees declining, we thought that it was the spread of disease from um, commercial bees to wild bees. So we, you know, we, we, did, we have, um, I published a few papers on what's called pathogen spillover from commercial bee, bumblebees to wild bumblebees. Um, so these commercial bees can hold high levels of, of pathogens because they've got it. They've got it made. They've got as much as they they can eat. They're you know all of these things. They have high levels. They go to flowers and they contaminate the nectar, and then the wild bees get infected, feeding on the same flowers. Recently, it's been shown that diseases from honeybees are also moving into wild bees. And so we're we're in the lab. We're studying the the effects of immune the immune system on bees, and we're also studying the effects of pesticides. And I will say that the, the pesticides, um, again, I'm, I'm trying to focus more on these two things. So um, for the sake of time, I didn't show the pesticide data, but just uh, be aware that, that bumblebees are, are twice as sensitive to pesticides as honeybees, and that's bombus and Haitians, which is doing well. Male bumblebees are much more sensitive than worker bumblebees, and species in decline are much more sensitive than the uh, bombus and patients, the ones that are stable. Now, how much more sensitive? Five or seven parts per billion um, will uh, kill off bombus vegans, shown here, which is in decline, in three days. If it's, if it's fed five parts per billion, which is well below what is acceptable. And so, what I'll say about the neonicotinoids is that they're testing acute. They're not thinking about chronic ingestion, so you can imagine the reason we can't eat a lot of salmon and if, we're, if we go out fishing we have a limit on how much trout we can eat is because they have mercury and lead in them and we'll, if we eat too much of it, we're going to get the effects of the mercury and lead because it accumulates. It's the same with the neonicotinoids. The bees can't break it down fast enough, so it builds up to levels where it becomes toxic. And so, you know, they, the bees are visiting thousands of flowers a day and they're ingesting tons of the pesticide in small amounts. And that's not the way they, they assess the effect of, or, or the, um, the, the risk of pesticides. And they're certainly not looking at species in decline. In fact, our study on Bombus vegans is the only study that's looked at the effect of neonicotinoids on a species that's actually in decline, other than the honeybee, if, you, if colony collapse is considered um, decline. Um, they're using Bombus and patients, which is doing very well. So of course if you don't see an effect, that doesn't mean that it's not going to have an effect on the decline. That's the type of bias that we're, we're trying to, we're trying to uh, equal things out with our research. Can you, can you comment on the non-native bullet there? Um, yes, I will show you data on the non-native to show you that um, go native, I have data to suggest that actually exotic plants are driving decline. That's actually what's, what's causing that plus habitat loss, meaning that there are fewer resources. The plant species, the bees that were using the exotics, like red clover, in areas where there's reduced red clover, the bee species, um, one wins and the other two get outcompeted. Those are the ones that are in decline. Mm -hmm. So um, this this is a major problem. And then in terms of the impact of honeybees, this we're collecting data on honeybees, and so. Ideally, they'd be using exotics that the natives aren't using, but I know that there's some overlap, and it's it's unclear what effect, you know. And from an ecological perspective, the honeybees are not native, but from plants, I'll show you some data to help to convince you that we should we should encourage purple loose strife. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. Can people buy pesticides that like that, <clears throat> like at Lowe's or Home Depot? Yes. What yeah. are the what are that's, what um, do they so sell them as? Because I, I had these slides in and I took them out because for the sake of time. So the problem with the neonicotinoids, oh, yes, it's called um, 
to treat rose bushes. It's, it's um, bare rose and something. There, I have a list that's mm, three okay. pages long of different things with neonicotinoids in them. Um, and so actually the use of neonicotinoids um, for gardens is going to uh, exceed the use in agricultural areas in the next 10 years. Mm. So the problem is, is, is um, home use and parks and things, not necessarily agricultural. And what happens is that the new ones can persist in the soil for three years, and they're taken up by every plant that touches the soil with the, with the compound. And now we're showing that five parts per billion is having an effect on just a couple of species that we know about, let alone the small bees that rely on, on the nectar and pollen. Um, so yeah, it, and the other thing too is if you buy plants from the nursery, they treat the plants with you know, nicotinoids often. So if you buy about 100 plants for your garden, all the soil, if you use the potting soil, all has neonicotinoids in it, and you're putting it into your garden, and it's just, it's going to persist for three years and get into the rest of the plants in your garden, right? So that's, that's the problem with the neonicotinoids, so all right? Willing, and, they, and they target the insect nervous system, and... Would you be willing to share that list with us so we can email it to everybody if people are interested? Uh, that certainly, would be good, certainly. Um, so, the other, so the, the, um, the one thing I want to say about the neonicotinoids, and I kept this on, is we're trying to figure out how is it we can go out and assess if a bee has been exposed to neonicotinoids and also is it infected without having to crush it up and, and, and um, to, to measure the level of the neonicotinoid. So what we can do is we can look at gene expression. So this is if we feed a bee just for three days, five parts per billion of clothianidin, which is one of the latest and greatest neonics, there is a complete change in <clears throat> gene expression. That all of these genes related to reproduction, related to learning, related to um, like different physiological pathways are all activated and males have different genes activated than others. So their detoxification, so, so they do detoxify to some extent, but if they're taking in more than they can detoxify, it builds up. And also a lot of the metabolites, so when they break down the pesticides through these detoxification pathways, are more toxic than the initial compound. That's how clothianidin was actually discovered. Is that the meta it's a metabolite of, uh, I think, imidacloprid, or uh, I could be wrong on that. But they, the, the metabolite more is, is what was killing them, not the, not the imidacloprid. And so they developed that into a new neonic. That's the way that they developed these things. And so we, we are able to go out now, and I have a collection of genes, and I can take um, the, uh, a bee from the field, and I can look at its gene expression pattern and tell you if it's been exposed to levels of neonics that you couldn't detect.
other is it changes the, the competitive environment for the bees. And so if certain bees love it and it's got tons of nectar and others don't like it, then the ones that like it are going to go up in number because there's tons of food, and the other ones that don't like it are going to be at a competitive disadvantage. Similarly, a lot of bees might like purple loosestrife, but some might be better at getting the nectar than others. If we reduce the amount of loosestrife, the ones that aren't as good are going to get outcompeted, right? Because the ones that are good are going to get that nectar from that limited resource, and we're going to see bees get pushed up. We think that's what's going on with red clover. Okay? So that's how competition might, and exotic plants may be um, playing a role in this. Now, in terms of climate change, I just want to point out in the buffering that the purple loosestrife is doing, so this is at Breakneck Hill. Remember last year we had that warm period, so this is the average, and um, this is showing the actual temperature range. So this is highs and lows. So last year we had unusually high temperatures in the spring, followed by massive chill. Yeah, it was like 20 degrees for a few days and we had snow, versus 2015 where we didn't get that. The change in the uh, population change from 2016 to 2015, we saw a 100% reduction wow. in some species. We didn't even find a firmness, 95% uh, reduction in perplexus. Impatience, because of purple loosestrife, showed a 30% increase. Huh. Just because of purple loosestrife. Hmm. And so now, this year, because these ones are all not as abundant, this one's abundant, we expect the diversity to even be lower at breakneck because they, they were able to increase in number when these other ones were really, um, they weren't very much abundant. Think about all the queens competing for nest sites if they're all underground nesters. There are going to be hundreds of impatience queens versus just a handful of these other species. So, you know, that, that's what we think is really going on here. Um, and I will say the good news, I'll finish on a high note, milkweed, in terms of a native, supporting a native bee species. Wachusett has tons of milkweed compared to breakneck. Here's the breakneck, the, the um, milkweed bloom at breakneck, we see a little bit of an increase. But at Wachusett, we see getting into the hundreds of bees. Um, and so just by planting a lot of milkweed, you're not only helping modern butterflies, but you're also helping this Bombus griseocolis because they love <coughs> milkweed. Um, and so it works both ways. Exotics and plant natives, you're going to get Increase populations of bees, increase exotics, and and um, it just it changes the competitive environment. Okay, but I will say that not just grizzly pools, a lot of our native bees like this versus blue stripe, where only one likes it, the other ones don't seem to like it. Okay. So um, I'm, again, I apologize for going on. There are a couple of important points I wanted to make, um, but now we switch to the you know we've developed this technology to try to help us to collect data to fill in these gaps. Hopefully I've convinced you that we have knowledge gaps that are important to fill. And, and maybe I went on and on and sort of beat you over the head with a lot of things. But um, um, that what the app's going to allow us to do is to look at not just bees. There are already programs out there looking at bumblebees, like bumblebee spotter. They want to know where the bumblebees are at, in different years. But they're not asking you what plant species they're visiting. So if we want conservation, we can either spot bees and watch them decline, or we can collect data on the plants they're using and try to figure out what we need to do to stop it and what might be causing the decline. That's the approach we're taking. Right? So what the app does is not only do we want to know the bee, but we want to know what plant species it's on and ideally what else is in the area. So we can try to figure out these preferences. And if we get every, like, you know, every county in Massachusetts to participate, over a short period of time, I can guarantee you, because in two years we're figuring out a lot of things we didn't know about species relationships. Um, across the state, we're really going to be able to get things together quickly and then we'll be able to develop these effective strategies. Plant lists for different areas and, and different species and, and things like that through the whole year. Pollen versus nectar sources, that type of thing. And so the app's allowing us to do that. And so at this point it's Android, I realize most, like it's half and half on an, an iPhone. You know, it's expensive, it's harder to do an iPhone, but we are getting there. And so in the meantime, in the next week or so, we're going to have a web app that, that iPhone users can can uh, contribute to the database, and then eventually we'll have an iPhone app. All right. So um, this is going to be ready in a couple of weeks. So if you could, you know, if you're an iPhone user and you want to participate in the project, collect data, just send me your email. When it's ready, I'll send you the link, and you can you can participate that way. The logistics of the whole thing is the same no matter if you're iPhone or Android. So I'm going to go over that in a, in a general. Um, is that addressed on the handouts? This one? Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, it's, it's, it's in the email that was sent out, yeah. and I, you know, I think I've added this after the handouts were made, so I don't think it is, and that's an oversight on my part. So my email's on there, though. So if you email me, I can I can give you the the link to the app, um, or you can um, I can email it to you. You know, we'll get it to you if if you need it, and then you can if you're. It out with Emails. We've got everybody's email address. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Just send it out again. And I, I, some people are having problems installing it. And again, call me, and we'll, we'll um, help you work through it. And again, the, you're the first ones to use this app with it hooked up to the database. So when you go out and log bees, in fact, we're actually, I'm actually, I can see the data that you're getting. We're starting to build the database. So it's an important sort of the pilot group. If you're interested, if you're not, you know, there are other ways you can participate. Um, but uh, ideally, you would have large areas of land like this, and you would go out, you know, once a week for a walk and just record bees that you see, and get that into the database. And I can quickly see, um, you know, we can start to build, um, get the information we need to be able to support the bees. Um, and you know, we're doing other things too. We've got computer models to look at population change. Once we get data from the app on preference, we can see how if we introduce purple loose stripe into an area, how it might affect things. So we have these virtual bees that make decisions. We've got plants, and, and it's all based on biology. And so we can look at, in the lab, we know that pesticides have change behavior in this way. We can put it into our bees in the model and look at how population changes over five years to try to see if the trajectory is similar to what we're seeing in the wild, stuff like that. And so field studies and the lab experiments, the database all together, that's how we're putting things together to try to figure out what's going on with our um, native bees. And again, we're starting with bumblebees, Massachusetts, but it's really New England I'm interested in. If we go farther north, there are other bumblebee species that aren't in the app right now, which is why I'm sort of limiting it, because I know what's here. Um, but we're going to expand to butterflies next. Like we can, we can tailor the app to, to we're going to expand things, but we have to start somewhere to convince people that this is a good idea. The crowdsourcing and using citizen scientists is a good way to quickly figure out what's missing for these species. All right, and that's the pitch I'm giving, and, and we'll see if it convinces funding agencies, <laughs> which is a whole other problem. But um, but certainly the technology is now there, and we just need the, the people to to, um, to to start to populate the database. So if you want to become what I'm calling an ecologist, eventually I'll have t need T-shirts made up to reward people. Um, I don't have the funding for that now. You can just you know feel free to use the try. You know, I had to think of something catchy, and I'm not I'm science, I'm not arts, so this is the best I can come up with. <laughs> uh, it's kind of, you know it gets the point across, but it, it probably could be more creative. Anyway, um, so you know if you could provide so the ways you can participate, obviously you get the app, or if you don't have the app, you're not comfortable with with cell phones. I've got ID sheets here, and you can just go out in your garden or in, on your land, and you can look to see which species you have and record it. Um, my student uses um, just like a recording device, and she walks through and says, "Bomb some patients on red clover," and that's how we collect it. And then she goes back and listens to it and enters everything into Excel. So you can do something similar and send me the data, and then I can put it in the in the database. Um, give us access to lands that, like the ones that I mentioned. Um, for us to survey, running the workshop, you know. Um, and so here are the species that we're really interested in. Obviously aphids, but this is what Tericola looks like. Um, so, um, so this is how you can participate. Now, getting to the app and how you ID bumblebees. Uh, BID. So just the crash course on how to ID bumblebee. Now I'm going to use the app or I'm going to take a video. If you didn't have that, you could use my color pattern. And again, Plexus comes in a couple of more forward. You want to work with the abdomen of the bee. And you'll notice that there, if we look at lines, you can tell these different segments. The segments. They started doing this, I said, okay, segment. And everybody got confused too. So the way abdomen first always. More than half black and half yellow or non-black. Really mostly Yellow is Bombus trinarius, which is very, has this very bright looking bee. And it, that's how you tell that it. it's the, this bright, you, you can't mistake, but less than half, more or less the same. And then the short tongue, medium tongue, but when you look at your garden, but you don't see any of this particular, this one or this one, 
then you need you probably need more tubular flowers in your garden. You can use it as a, a general guide to, to assess the pollinator friendliness of your garden. Okay. So I've got those handouts available. This information is also in the app, but um, but you could just use this as a you know I'd like to laminate these and get a little pocket guide, and I haven't I haven't done that yet, and get more information. Um, but the, so I've invested my time in the app instead of fancy little cards. But um, but so this this should help you to ID and also to, to to see how well you're doing in terms of, of bees in your garden. So for the app, and there's a lot of text here, and I have the handout with all the text on it. I just want to so for those of you that have the app, um, I could so I'll, I'll walk you. So how many of you have the app that's actually you've installed it? Okay. Wait. So that's not good. so I I've got yeah, it's good, iPhone. it's good. IPhones. <laughs> iPhones. Okay. So let's let's just let's just take a general way and then the, the people with the app. I have two phones with the app and we'll look at that. One so, other thing real quickly is yeah. I tried downloading it yeah. and I get all sorts of flags. Yes. That, that I got warnings too. That yeah, so frightened me to not do it. Right, I know. And so um, and I should have put this in the email that you should just so because it's not on the app store, right. you're going to get those flags, and it's going to ask you about location because we want to know where you're getting the data, and it's going to ask you for access to your photo gallery because if you've taken photos, right. you can use the app. So um, that's why it's asking for those permissions, and then because it's not from the app store, it's telling you, do you trust the source? Okay. And so click yes on those, and trust me that it's not. I'm not okay. I'm not. If your phone dies because of my app, then I'll buy you a new phone. All right. <laughs> I can't replace the pictures, but I can guarantee you that it's okay to install. And I should have mentioned that in the email, and I apologize. So I have to go through all of those permissions as well. When we get it into the store, you won't have to, it's a trusted source, but you will still have to give the app permission for location to turn on your GPS and your um, get access to your, your um, gallery. And because only those pictures that are associated with that software will be accessible. Right, so when you open the app it, you, and you hit log a B, it will say import picture is one of the options. If you import picture, it will open up your gallery and you can go to the folder that has the picture and it will take that picture and put it into the app. You ID the B and it sends it to the database of WPI. Okay. Okay? And, uh, and so that's yes. You have to say yes to those things and I apologize for not. And if you don't want to do it, then there's another way, there's the web app. So there you just have to get the pictures on your phone and you can upload them to the web app and no permissions and we'll go to the database when we have that ready in two weeks if you're not comfortable using the phone app, okay? And Rob, when you say web app, you mean website, right? It, 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 yes, so there, the computer science people are calling it a web app. So we're gonna have a website, but basically our app is going to be on the site. So you can go use right. the, um, your browser Mm -hmm. to get to the app and use the app as Android users can use the app right. with the iPhone. So it's going to have the same set of rules, it's just how you get there. We're working on how to integrate that in. So that's right. how we're getting around the iPhone app issue. Okay? Okay. Um, but the general idea is that to IDBs, you absolutely have to take a video. Okay. If you try to take pictures, it's not going to work. The bees are moving quickly. If you've ever watched a single bumblebee, yep. They're trying to get that nectar as quickly as possible, and you will be... Uh, digital cameras help, because if you just hit speed photo, and one of them's going to turn out. But if you take just a 5 to 10 second video of a bee on a flower, I can ID that bee 100%. Like, assuming that it's, it's, it's not a complete blur. So you want to hold your phone when you're taking a video about a foot from the flower. If you can see the bee, that's great. You want to get the bee a good size in the frame. And then you take that 5 to 10 second video, and then you're going to go back and watch the video, and you're going to go frame by frame. So you can use the slider. If you've ever, you know, for those of you that have taken videos on your cell phone, you've probably, you know, slowed it down, or you can use the slider to find the spot where the bee is in the right position. Right position, all of these pictures are the bee in the right position. You want to be able to see the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, either, and on a slight angle is ideal. That way, you can match it to the color pattern. If you only see the head, or you only see the rear end up and you don't see the thorax, it makes it more difficult to ID it. Now, not impossible, just more difficult. So you just want the bee at some point in the video to turn, if the bee's in the flower, it doesn't matter what the flower is, it's going to back out, or if it's on the top of the flower, it's going to stay there for a little bit, and then it's going to fly off. And as it's flying, it's going to turn. And you can stop the frame, and then you take either a snapshot or a picture of that frame in your video, and you save it. 
And then that's how you're going to log the bee. You either import it into the app, or you upload it to the web app site, the website, and you go through the ID process, and you click enter, and it gets sent to your log, and then from the log it goes to the, you send it to the database, and then we have the information. So it's the bee, and then also it's going to ask you what plant species is it on. So that part you might not know immediately, and so there are going to be options. Is it tubular? Is it, you know, it'll talk about color and shape, things that would be important for me to understand relationships between things. Ideally, you would follow it up with the proper plant ID. Um, but when you send the picture, I get to see the picture, so I can ID the plant. As long as you have a good picture of a bee on a flower, and I can tell what the flower, usually I can tell what the flower is. So it seems like when we take the video, if we're not good at plant ID, you have your five to ten seconds of the bee, and then you can just you know, move it out a little bit so I can see more of the plant. Is that helpful? Yeah, so it would be helpful if you were to, and we're working on this part of the app, is to take a separate picture of the plant. So there's something called PlantNet, where you can, through using face recognition software, you can take a picture of a flower and it'll ID the species. Now, it's a work in progress, right? It's using a learning algorithm. So the more people that try it, the more accurate it gets. Right now, I've tried it, and it's, eh, I give it three stars out of five. But it's getting better. Um, you certainly can take a picture and send me the picture and say, I don't know what, what plant okay. species this is. Or if you go to Go Botany, it's a great site. Yeah. If you follow their key, it's like an amazing site for IDing plants and telling you whether it's native or exotic. Okay. Um, I go there, I have it bookmarked, and I go there to figure out if things are native or exotic all the time. Because, you know. What did you say the, ID, the, the automatic, um, the other net site? Yeah, and so it's it's I'm, we're working on it. And if, oh, you, okay. if you are an iPhone user, or even if you're Android, you want to use the web, just send me your email, and I will okay. e email out the web when it's ready to go, which is going to be in the next couple of weeks. We just had a meeting yesterday, and there's, you know, again, it's me talking to computers. A biologist talking to computer scientists, and you, know, you got to translate like, the language. Um, but uh, I've been told that. There was some major breakthrough. It's going to be very easy to get the app as it is functioning on the web for iPhone users in the next two weeks for sure. Okay, and, and the good thing is here, you're two weeks behind where we are in Southboro around, one to two weeks. So in two weeks, you'll be able to collect lots of data for the rest of the summer, and it's going to be very useful. So even though it's a bit, you know, starting in here because of elevation, it's, it's actually going to work out quite nicely, I think. Yes? I, I I don't know where everyone else is with technology, but is this? It would be nice if you had a PowerPoint show on how to run the actual app because I'm trying to think yes. to myself right now. I'm saying, okay, take a video. Can do that on a phone. Yeah. Now, am I going to send that to you right from the phone, or do I now yeah. have to get on so, the computer? You know, you raise a good point. Capture the frame. Yeah. Send it. You know, Tutorial. now it's technology a little bit more. Tutorial. Yeah. No, you and if you had the app installed, I was going to walk everybody through it. And since you don't, I mean, I can pass the. What I'll do is I will. Pa I have three phones. That including my personal phone, which God knows what's on there. Just don't go into anything. <laughs> stay stay uh, on the on the on the golden brick road or um, with the app. But I'll pass it around, and maybe we can get into small groups. And I've got three phones, and we'll just I'll walk through the app with everybody together. Is that? But some, somebody like your techie could make a, a YouTube video on how to do it. We could do that. Oh, right. yeah. great. Five minutes. We know, could, I'll, I'll do it myself. And we it's could, a great idea. And they did tell me there's a way I could hook my phone up to my computer and project it. Yeah. And I tried. Yeah. And it didn't work. Again. Because the word easy is a very relative term. Yes. Are you interested in older data? Older pictures? Yeah, I'll take any pictures of bumblebees that you have. Yep. Okay. Yep. If you know when you took them and where you took the picture, then yeah. So I do garden photography, yep. macro work. Right. I have eight Perfect. years worth of yes. macro. Oh, my God. that's um, great. So yes. I can tell you where, and it's digital, so you can yes, see everything. I, that okay. would be amazing. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. Well, it doesn't, I mean, again, it's the relationships. And if you've got, if you know the plant species, you know the time that you took the photo and things like that, then uh, that's amazing. Yeah, that would be great. So if any of the rest of you have any of something, anything like that, so how do I get those? To, I have you? lots of students to input it into the database. Yeah. Do you have a Dropbox account? Um, if you email me, I will set one up so that you okay. can either Google Drive. I'll, I'll 
figure out a way that you'll be able to drop those photos somewhere. So just email me whenever you can, and I will set it up and email you back and say, here, click the link. And do you have a Flickr account? So if I send you a link to an album that I have already? I do have a Flickr account. Okay. It's, so I'll just it's email not, you. not for No, well, just so you can get in and see yeah. my... Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Please. Yes, okay. I do. Um, okay, so um, I'll answer questions as I'm handing out phones. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So I have a fair amount of pictures of bees from the Bridge of Flowers in Shelburne Falls. Okay. Are those useful to you or no? Any picture of a bumblebee that you have is useful to me. So as long as you know it's a bumblebee, and, you, and again, you know, even if you don't know all the details, I want to know what species it is. Because if, if you took a picture of one of these species I'm looking for, and you know where you took the picture, I'll be there tomorrow. Right? So all of it is good. This is just a way to help. If I get, imagine if I got a thousand emails from people, I have to sort them. This helps me get stuff into a database where I can look at it without having to spend hours going through everything. But that being said, if you have that type of thing, hundreds of pictures, send them to me because I'll have, I can have lots of students, undergrads. It's a perfect project for them to, to sort all this stuff. Um, they're looking for things to do. Yeah. Um, so we were supposed to have another person come with us, but she was not feeling well. So. This is a very um, helpful and useful um, presentation that you gave. Is there yeah. some way we can um, access that for this other person? Uh, well, it's being recorded. Okay. Uh, so we'll put it up on YouTube. Okay. Uh, I think the trustees will be putting it up on YouTube. Awesome. Yeah, right? That's great. Right. Right. That's great. And anything I said, you cannot hold against me. <laughs> who knows, who knows In fact, I could, on, I could tape you doing, going through the app huh? right now and put it up as well. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, that, that would probably be a good idea. Because then you don't have to. Yeah. That's okay. Should we try to break up in a few groups? Yes. As we do that. Okay. Yes. Why don't we do? Why don't we do that? Um, and, and why don't I show people the app? There are a lot of bees out, and it's getting later, and I, um, I'm sort of torn whether to show you the app or to go look at bees. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's go look at bees. Video. Um, so I can zoom in to the and on my phone, go frame by frame. Yeah. But I can so on the on my Samsung Five, um, if I I can uh, do um, play speed um, on, uh, and close it. And so when I I can go frame by frame, right? And then and so I press play and I get it to the, so that. Be in frame, and then I can frame by frame to a spot where I want. So it's it, you know it's blurry. Um, and so what I can do, my phone, I can take a picture of it. Or if you do a screen cap, I hit both of these. It's a screen. It's Androids. It's either home button. It will take your. It'll be in your gallery, and you still from the gallery. So kills to save space, and then you want you import them into the app, and it will in time and location. And, and you could also upload to do it as well. Right. Okay. Okay. Screen. Screen.